Imagine losing $20 billion in 48 hours. Sounds pretty much impossible, right? Well, today I'm going to tell you a little story. A story about a man who lost his multi-billion dollar fortune thanks to his own hubris. A story about Wall Street recklessness in a time we thought it was behind us. This is a story, folks, that you can't afford to miss. Now, I know you cannot wait to hear what I have to say, but continuing without a disclaimer just would not be okay. Nothing in this video is financial or investment advice. It's just some good old educational content, and don't make me say that twice. Please contact a financial advisor if you want to get your investments right. If this is the first time I'm in your site, my name is Guy, and crypto is what I like. The Coin Bureau is home to some of the highest quality content online. Coins, tokens, news, reviews, and other crypto-related topics that cross my mind. If this is what you're here for, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell to make sure you always get more. If time is not on your side, you can use the timestamps provided in the timeline below to skip ahead to any interesting topics you find. Just remember that the longer you stick around, the more this video will get found. Now, there's no time to waste, so let's dive in and see how someone lost $20 billion in just over two days. Okay, it's story time with Guy. So strap in, grab a cup of something hot, and get ready, folks, because this story is going to blow your socks off. First of all, the topic in question is Bill Huang and his Archegos Capital Management Hedge Fund. Before he lost all of his $20 billion, Bill Huang was arguably the greatest trader on Wall Street that you'd never even heard of. Ironically, you're more likely to have heard of him since March of last year, when his $20 billion net worth was reportedly wiped out in the space of 10 days. Now, starting in 2013, Bill turned more than $200 million left over from his previous venture into an even more unbelievable fortune by betting on the stock market. Had he folded his hand in early March of 2021 and cashed in, Bill would have stood head-to-head -head with some of the world's top billionaires. But alas, this wasn't to be. And the sudden implosion of Bill's Archegos Capital Management in late March of 2021 is commonly referred to as one of the most spectacular failures in modern financial history. Because, quite frankly, no individual has lost so much money in such a short time frame. Now, at its peak, Bill's wealth briefly passed the $30 billion mark. But his financial case is an intriguing one for all the wrong reasons. Now, unlike the Wall Street stars and Nobel laureates who ran long-term capital management, which famously blew up in 1998, Bill Huang remained largely unknown outside a small circle. A small circle made up of fellow churchgoers and former hedge fund managers, as well as a handful of bankers. But all of this begs the following question. Who on earth is Bill Huang and what is Archegos Capital Management? All right. Let me explain. Bill Huang is a long way from the archetypal, larger-than-life finance bro one might expect to find at the center of a major financial fiasco. There's no rooftop overlooking Manhattan's Central Park, no fancy cars, expensive chalets, or flexy social life. Just a man living in a suburban home in New Jersey and driving a standard Hyundai SUV. Bill's truly is the paradoxical story of an individual devoted to his church and driven to give generously with an unprecedented appetite for casino-like risk in his professional life. He seems rather modest-looking on the outside, right? Well, he had all the swagger he needed inside the Wall Street prime brokerage departments that finance big investors. Now, Sung Kuk Hwang came to the US from South Korea in 1992 and took the name Bill. Raised by his widowed mother, he attended the University of California in Los Angeles and eventually earned an MBA from Carnegie Mellon University. At a videotaped business school reunion that was posted online in 2008, Bill recounted the one major objective he wanted to achieve after his graduation, moving to New York. In 1996, after stints as a salesman at Hyundai Securities, he landed a job as an analyst at the highly respected Tiger Management. Tiger Management, also known as, quote, the Tiger Fund, is an American hedge fund and family office founded by Julian Robertson. 
The fund began investing in 1980 and closed in March 2001, but it continues to operate today in direct public equity investments and seeding new investment funds. Now, working for Julian Robertson, a real titan in the industry, was basically like playing for the New York Yankees for Bill Huang. And so, after joining the powerhouse hedge fund, Tiger Management, Bill became a, quote, Tiger Cub. Now, the term Tiger Cub is commonly used on Wall Street to describe the former employees, or disciples, if you will, of Julian Robertson. And this is because anyone who had previously worked under Robertson was usually able to spin off and start their own profitable ventures, including some of the world's most successful and well-recognized hedge funds. These include the likes of Andreas Halverson's Viking Global Investors, Philippe Lafont's Cochu Management, and Chase Coleman's Tiger Global Management. Now, as Bill recalled at the business school reunion, Robertson taught him a key lesson when it comes to fundamental investment strategies. And that lesson was to learn to live with financial losses. In fact, at one point, Tiger had burned through a whopping $2 billion for being on the wrong side of a trade against the Japanese yen. But Julian Robertson reportedly remained unfazed by this cataclysmic loss. Anywho, following in the footsteps of fellow Tiger Cubs, Bill decided to start his own fund. This was actually at the urging of his mentor, Julian Robertson himself. Robertson also offered to seed him some of the startup capital. And that's what allowed Tiger Asia to start. Now, Bill founded the Tiger Asia Management Hedge Fund in 2001, and it soon became a hugely successful firm. At one point, it was reportedly managing $10 billion in assets. Bill initially sought to differentiate himself and his hedge fund by investing heavily in the Asian stock market and focusing primarily on Korean, Japanese, and Chinese companies that generated all of their revenue domestically. According to former clients and colleagues, Bill concentrated the Tiger Asia portfolio in a small number of stocks and leveraged it. Some of his 25 or so positions were longs and some were short trades. Naturally, right? But Bill always remained rather secretive, often concealing particularly large holdings from his own team of analysts, a pattern which he repeated years down the line with Archegos, which I'll get to in a bit. Now, at least once, Bill stepped over the line between aggressive and illegal. In fact, after years of investigation in 2012, the US Securities and Exchange Commission accused Tiger Asia Management of insider trading and market manipulation in two Chinese bank stocks. The agency accused Bill of receiving confidential information about pending share offerings from the underwriting banks and then using it to capitalize and reap illicit profits. Bill settled the case without admitting or denying any wrongdoing, and Tiger Asia pleaded guilty to a US Department of Justice charge of wire fraud, which subsequently led Bill to close down his Tiger Asia fund. After that, Bill started Archegos Capital Management. Now, Archegos was what was called a family office. Technically speaking, a family office is an investment firm managing money for an individual, in this case, Bill. But instead of attempting to open a new hedge fund with the taint of a securities violation, he decided to take the money that he'd already had within his personal asset portfolio, invest it in his own assets, and hire his own analysts, effectively continuing his financial operations this way. With Archegos, Bill's investments proved incredibly successful. And true to the traditional Huang investing strategy, he solely focused on a few hand-picked stocks and positions. And he deployed this strategy incredibly well. To begin with, that is. First of all, he allocated capital heavily into tech stocks. This enabled him to ride the decade-long, supremely lucrative tech boom led by firms such as Amazon, LinkedIn, Netflix, Google, Expedia, and Facebook. The second component of his strategy revolved around using an increasing amount of borrowed money, aka leverage. Yep, I'm looking at you, Bitcoin futures traders. Now, US rules prevent individual investors from buying securities with more than 50% of the money borrowed on margin. But interestingly, no such limits apply to hedge funds or family offices. The whole idea of setting up Archegos as a family office starts to make sense now, doesn't it? 
According to employees and other people who were familiar with Arcagos, it was reported that the firm consistently began ramping up its leverage over time. Initially, the firm's leverage positions were set at 2x, which essentially equates to $1 million borrowed for every $1 million of capital deployed. But by late March of 2021, Bill's leverage was at 5x or more. Now, because Arcagos borrowed a lot of money to leverage and increase its position size, this also meant that the firm's gains were exacerbated. And Arcagos then redeployed its gains into the same bet. By using this strategy, Bill managed to grow his initial available capital, left over from his Tiger Asia Management Fund, which was around $200 million, into a $20 billion fortune in a little under seven years. That's right, folks. He hit that divine 100x we in crypto all crave on a daily basis. And this was no DeFi, but TradFi at its finest. Now, the third component of his investment strategy was a rather unorthodox one his utter dedication to being a good Christian and to his faith. Okay, I know this might sound a bit odd, but let me explain. Contrary to the Wall Street rock star he could have been, for years Bill was a pillar of his church community. He even founded a charitable foundation called the Grace and Mercy Foundation that donated millions of dollars a year towards Christian causes. Bill also hosted three scripture readings a week at his foundation offices in the heart of Manhattan, where he would relate and analyze biblical scriptures. In essence, a man thoroughly devoted and focused on spreading the word of God. Now, he believed that by investing in these stocks and companies through Archegos, he was effectively advancing society on God's behalf. This was most definitely an alternative approach to investment, and through his faith, Bill seemed to find a justification for all his investments, stick with them and double down on them, irrespective of the hedges he would have had to have in place. During his religious meetings, he would relay stories about Wall Street's money-hungry, capital-driven way of life and power obsession, constantly shedding light on the holy and necessary role that religion should play in driving the world of finance forward. Furthermore, his seminary retreats offered a glimpse of how he reconciled faith with finance. As he explained it, cutting-edge tech companies such as Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Netflix were fundamentally doing divine work by advancing and bettering society. He also told attendees at his 2019 appearance at Metro Community that God endorsed Alphabet's Google because it provided, quote, the best information to everybody. All hail the almighty algorithm. Ultimately, Bill believed that by simply professing his own faith, he possessed a truly fearless way to invest. But his enlightened self also coexisted with his other, more obscure side. In fact, Bill kept his banks and brokers in the dark by executing trades via swap agreements. In a typical swap, a bank gives its client exposure to an underlying asset such as a stock. And while the client gains or loses from any changes in price, the bank still shows up in filings as the registered holder of the shares. This is precisely how Bill managed to amass such huge positions in the background. And because lenders only had details of their dealings with him, they also couldn't have direct access to the amount he was piling on leverage in the same stocks via swaps with other banks. Now, it's important to note that leverage was playing a growing role on Wall Street during the 2000s and 2010s, and Bill Huang's risk appetite always led him towards wanting more. Banks such as Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley had been doing business with Archegos for years, regardless of Bill's brushes with regulators. And at the close of every trading day, Archegos would settle its swap accounts. If the total value of its positions in the account rose, the bank in question would pay Archegos in cash. If the value fell, however, Archegos would have to put up more collateral or post-margin in Wall Street lingo. Now, the fourth quarter of 2020 was a fruitful one for Bill and his family office. While the S&P 500 appreciated by almost 12%, seven of the stocks Archegos was known to hold gained more than 30%. Other stocks such as Baidu, Vipshop, and Farfetch jumped at least 70%. That's a pretty impressive move in traditional markets, I must say. 
All this bullish activity and the firm's gains made Arcagos one of Wall Street's most reputable and respected clients. But the Tiger Cubs' decline began during the week of March the 22nd, 2021. The American mass media and entertainment conglomerate Viacom CBS, failing to keep up with the likes of Disney Plus and Apple TV and Netflix, announced a $3 billion sale of stocks and convertible debt. At that time, Arcagos had exposure to tens of millions of Viacom CBS's shares through a series of banks, including Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, and Wells Fargo, and had a huge outsized position in it. And every time the stock moved up in price, Bill would allocate more money to it, and the stock would simply carry on rising in value. But instead of helping the stock's price, the stock sale affected the asset terribly, and the following day, Viacom CBS's price fell by 9%. It then proceeded to tank by an additional 23%. Ouch. Thus, with the stock price declining so far and so fast, it forced what is called a margin call on Bill's highly overleveraged position. For those who don't know, a margin call occurs when the value of an investor's margin account falls below the broker's required amount to keep a position open. Essentially, in Bill's case, it was a demand by Wall Street firms for more collateral. Given that Bill had borrowed such a ridiculously outsized amount of money for his Viacom position and, due to the stock's declining trend, there was no liquidity left to keep his position open. Therefore, banks naturally demanded more collateral. Bill's bets had suddenly gone haywire, jeopardizing his swap agreements. A few banks pleaded with him to sell his shares, meaning he would have taken some losses but would have lived to fight another day, avoiding a complete default. But Bill Huang refused. Ah, classic Bill. I think he forgot the advice that his mentor, Julian Robertson, imparted. Learn to live with the losses. Now, if it had been just one bank making the demand for a margin call, he perhaps would have been able to stomach it. But when all of his banks made the demand, well, that was a real problem. And this signified the beginning of the end for the Tiger Cup. Now, it is worth noting here that any fortune built on borrowed capital is naturally standing on shaky foundations. But in the case of Bill Huang, he was facing an earthquake. Stocks that he had invested heavily in were all of a sudden moving against him. And the worst part of it was that he had never implemented an effective hedging mechanism to protect himself or Arcagos against eventual losses. Of course, banks began to panic because they had loaned him an outstanding amount of money and they demanded that he post more upfront capital. Otherwise, they would have been forced to terminate his swap agreements and liquidate his portfolio. And that's exactly what occurred. He did not have enough cash lying around to meet the demands, so the big banks were forced to liquidate his entire portfolio. And just like that, all of his $20 billion portfolio was gone. Now, not only that, but the banks that had lent him money to leverage his positions also took quite the hit. Credit Suisse, for instance, lost a whopping $5.5 billion. Nomura in Japan lost in excess of $2.5 billion. And all because of Bill's excessively leveraged positions and inability to fund his unhedged margin calls. Now, it was only in the days after Credit Suisse and Nomura's crumble that analysts were able to piece together what had really happened. For years, Bill had operated as a whale, meaning someone with an outsized external influence on financial markets. But as an invisible whale of sorts, because almost nobody had heard of him, nor his family office, besides his employees and other investors close to him. And that all goes back to the financial instrument that he used, those mighty yet opaque swap agreements. Fundamentally, this is a type of financial derivative that allows the investor to remain pretty much invisible. This is because instead of his name appearing in securities filings, it was the name of the entity or bank he was dealing with, be it Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank. The banks appeared as the stockholders, whereas Bill was the one benefiting from the moves in the price of the stock. Therefore, through swaps, he was able to remain anonymous through the trading process. And in the wake of this financial fiasco, because of his swap agreements and almost anonymity, 
we aren't too sure about what Bill Huang has left, nor of any other investments he might have held. And with so little available financial disclosure, it's hard to know exactly what he has left after a calamity of this magnitude. So you may ask, what's the moral of this story? Well, what's surprising about this tale is that while it might seem like it, there is, technically speaking, no evidence that Archegos did anything improper. What happened with the Bill Huang case is pretty reminiscent of the subprime mortgage crisis, which occurred 16 years ago. Back then, just as with Bill, the main issue here was a series of increasingly irresponsible loans by big banks. And as long as house prices kept rising and appreciating, lenders ignored the growing risk levels. But when homeowners stopped paying, reality finally kicked in. The banks had financed so much borrowing that the fallout had become uncontainable, ultimately leading to the collapse of 2008. The best thing that we can say about the Archegos downfall is that it thankfully didn't cause a widespread market meltdown. That being said, what is really unfortunate about this story is that it was a completely preventable disaster, an eventuality that was endorsed once more by the greedy and profit-hungry big banks which had lent Bill Huang capital to fund his leveraged positions. Thus far, the prime brokerage business had not been top of mind for regulators, analysts and politicians. But after the Archegos fiasco, this is no longer the case. European rules, for instance, require the party bearing the economic risk of an investment to disclose its interest. And had regulators imposed a limit on the bank's lending abilities or imposed more visibility into Bill's trading activities across Wall Street, he and Archegos would perhaps have faced a very different fate. And maybe neither of them would have defaulted. I think that both banks and regulatory entities are to blame here, as there still don't seem to be the necessary levels of transparency required to execute financial operations effectively, nor the limitations required to protect investors and entities from major financial risk. Just think about the GameStop debacle in January of last year and the trading restrictions imposed by Robinhood on certain stocks. What a shambles that was. And just maybe that's why I'm such a major proponent of blockchain technology and its open source financial ecosystem. And that just about concludes today's video, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. But I would love your feedback on this one. Did you know about this crazy story? What do you think? And who do you think is to blame here? Fire those comments down below. Remember to subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell if you would like to keep getting the highest quality crypto content on the scene. Make sure you also check out the Coin Bureau Clips channel to get all the information you need on emergency crypto market moves. The Coin Bureau podcast is available on all major platforms and covers crypto from the very top. I'll see you very soon, but until then, this is where else I can be found. TikTok, Telegram, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribing to my weekly newsletter will make your crypto life supremely better. It's packed with all the tips and tricks that will make your gains stick. You may also want to check out my deals page. It's got some of the best crypto deals and promos on the market today. Thank you so much for watching, folks, and I'll see you all very soon. My name is Guy, and you have been watching The Coin Bureau. Thank <laughs> you.